Good evening. Welcome to our concert this evening. Been very excited putting this program together. It's been an opportunity for me to learn about composers that I really didn't know very much about. And that's been a real privilege. Um, so you can see the topic of our informants, as I'm calling it, uh, because we're definitely going to do a little talking about the pieces as we go. But is music of the marginalized? So who is marginalized? Um, it just depends on the context, but we obviously have over here a man who was born on a slave ship. I think we could all agree that that's a marginalization and that they're not usually very represented in the repertoire, particularly from this period. We have Elizabeth Jacquette de la Guerre representing women who are certainly over 50% of the population on this planet, yet oftentimes don't get their fair airtime. Um, we'll talk about her more in a little while. We've got Salomone Rossi, who unbelievably was able to function in a, you know, Europe that was strongly Christian and often pressured people to convert to Christianity. He was able to maintain his Jewish identity and yet very, be very successful at the court of Mantua. And then we also have this wonderful piece that is going to get its North American premiere. I think I'm right in saying it has only been played, sung in Venice before this. And that was rather a while ago. You'll hear more about that from our wonderful musicologist, Dr. Tacconi. So these are our composers that we're playing this evening. In many ways, you know, it's starting to get to be spring and we're all seeing things that grow. Some of those things are weeds. I have great respect for weeds because weeds grow up in the toughest places, right? You see a crack in a sidewalk and some weed decides it's going to plant itself there and it's going to grow, gosh darn it. And I find that amazing. So in some ways I feel these people in the very best sense of the word are all weeds that just decided they were going to grow somewhere that others were not able to. Um, I'm going to invite now a member of our ensemble, Dahlia Schwarzman, to come out and speak with me just a little bit about the first composer. Um, so Dahlia, if you can hear me, you can join me now. If not, I'll go knock on the stage door, perhaps. I think I'll go do that. All right, so Dolly is a violin performance major, and she is Jewish, so she has a very strong identification with Salomone Rossi, and I asked her to do a little bit of reading about him, and I thought we would just converse just a little bit about what it means to discover a composer that obviously is really important during this period and find out that there's something really special about their identity that you have in common with them. Yeah. Um, I think it's really special to be able to find a composer from the time period. I think for me, I associate Baroque music so strongly with liturgical music, and uh, it's very special to be able to play something that I know belongs to my heritage. Um, something I found interesting in doing a little bit of research about Solomon Rossi when Jim programmed him, I did some Googling and found... Um, works for vo vocal parts mostly that he wrote um, to which the words I recognized and I decided to also then do a little bit of digging and then found that he published a series of um, volumes of Hebrew text. Um, most of them came from Psalms or things for the Friday night Shabbos um, meal ceremony. Um, and a lot of them were from the Hallel which um, we sing um, in my Jewish education that we sing during the high holidays. Um, so I thought it was just super interesting that the same words that I've said in my childhood growing up attending Jewish school was also programmed in the 16th and 17th centuries. So the music you'll hear this evening is in, by, uh, by Rossi is instrumental, but it's interesting in reading about him that, yes, yeah, some of his strong contributions were actually liturgical music, and he was really interested in trying to modernize the music that was sung at synagogue at that point, so the music would sound 
sound more like his contemporaries, but it would have you know, the text in Hebrew. And it was interesting to imagine being a singer trying to, to decipher this because you're reading the music left to right, but Hebrew is read right to left. And so the text would be at the end of the line and have to be read the opposite direction than the notes. I think probably sight singing wasn't advised. You were supposed to prepare a little bit before in advance. Um, so anyway, a, a remarkable person, and he was able to functioned very well in both societies. He retained his Jewishness all the way through, which is not true. An awful lot of the great musicians with a Jewish background over the years have unfortunately been really pressured to convert. And he was able to not do that, to retain his Jewish identity and yet still function very well at the D Duke of Mantua's court. He didn't even have to wear the yellow star. This was a big deal that he didn't have to wear the yellow star. Um, so anyway, we're going to have three different pieces by three small groups. And Dahlia, I'll let you exit the stage. Thank you for sharing your viewpoint with us. So we're going to welcome first a brass trio. And this is the first time we've had brass players on our early music concert, so I'm really happy to have them here. Thanks, guys. Thank you. 
So most of the pieces you're hearing this evening, uh, you could consider more like musical tapas than perhaps a full entree. The sakini will probably come the closest to being that in terms of its breadth. Um, but I hope that in their brevity, they kind of pique your interest in wanting to discover more about these composers yourselves. Um, so in a minute, we're going to turn to the music of Elizabeth Jacquette de la Guerre. So she was an incredibly gifted prodigy who grew up in France during the time, the reign of Louis XIV. And her talent was recognized at a very young age. She was kind of taken under the wing of King Louis. Um, he had his mistress, he had several, but he had um, one of them really make sure that Elizabeth received a top-rate education, musical education, academic education. Her parents and her grandfather, they were, she came from a family of harpsichord builders. And when she married, she married the son of the organist at Saint-Chapelle in Paris. So when the court moved from Paris to Versailles, she stayed in Paris. Um, she had the high honor of being allowed, it was considered a really high honor, to be allowed to dedicate your music to the king, and virtually everything that she wrote, she was allowed to dedicate to him. The piece that we're going to play for you this evening is the overture to an opera that she wrote, the first opera known, anyway, to have been written by a French woman. Um, the music is fantastic. Apparently there were some problems with the plot and stuff like that. It only got played probably five or six times, which when you're putting on an opera, that isn't a lot of times because it costs a lot of money. So it wasn't a huge commercial success, but the music has survived for this. And I'm going to invite the orchestra, one of whom is right there, and the rest are backstage, to join me on stage. And we will explore the music of Elizabeth Jacquette de la Guerre. one of you got on stage. Isn't that nice? We thank you for that very much. Um, Spencer, are you going to tune the, tune the band, as it were? So before we launch into the performance, you're gonna get a little education, okay? You're getting value for those ticket prices. Um, in music of this period in France, oftentimes rhythms were not played exactly as they were written on the paper. And it's a little bit like in jazz, you often swing the rhythm, and this is very parallel to that. So what I'm gonna have the group do, and we call that inigal, okay? So we're gonna have them play the first part of the overture as it is printed on the page, and then this, on the repeat of that, they will play Inigal, and you will hear the difference between these two.
have the performance of the overture to the opera, and it will be played in Egal both times. Thank you all for a very spirited performance. If you recognize any of these faces, they've been performing in a lot of concerts recently. A number of them played with me and many of my colleagues, the Haydn Creation, across town at the high school yesterday. Then last week, you may have heard them, seen them, if you went down to the pit, playing in the opera scenes that were done. So they've been very busy, and we're really thankful for the wonderful energy that you're bringing to this program tonight. Um, so anyway, isn't that a fantastic piece of music? Just a fantastic piece of music, yeah.
So we're now gonna move to another super interesting composer and somebody I really, again, did not know anything about in my ignorance. Um, Ignatius Sancho, incredible person. And I, I'm gonna invite Tora to come over here and we're gonna have a little conversation about Sancho. Thank you for joining me. Um, so one thing that's, you have in common with Sancho is the fact that he was born he was born on a ship that was traveling to the West Indies and your family is from the West Indies, right? Yeah. So my mom is half Haitian and I'm half Antiguan and um, Sancho was taken to, he was supposed to go to Guyana, I believe, but he was there and then he got orphaned for after two years and then he went to England and he was the first black British person to ever vote, and he was an avid abolitionist as well. Well said, yeah. So he's important in many ways. He apparently was really, really well known in England. I mean, this is not the portrait up here by Thomas Gainsborough, but later in his life, he was painted by Gainsborough, and that obviously is a sign that he was really, really well known. So I wonder, how does that feel to you personally to feel like this person, to play music by somebody that you have this commonality with, Tora. Yeah, so playing Baroque, okay. yeah. playing Baroque music for most of my musical education, I did not have the luxury of uh, resonating with some of these artists. So getting to play somebody that probably might be in my heritage, especially as a Caribbean person, is very meaningful to me. Um, I played a lot of African American music. I don't get much experience playing music from those in my culture as a Caribbean woman, so I'm very excited to actually play something that means a lot to me in my heritage and my musical education. Thank you so much, thank you. So the pieces you're about to hear were originally written for harpsichord and various ensembles have set them. Um, I actually was exposed to these first by hearing the Juilliard Early Music Group Ensemble 415 play this with uh, the wonderful Baroque violinist uh, Rachel Podger leading them. And so I looked for arrangements of these and found these. So we're gonna have just two of these of the 12 country dances that he wrote, and I think you'll find a lot of fun in these. Thank you. 
So, orchestra, I'm going to invite you to, you can now be seated down here. We're going to have a lecture about the next piece from my distinguished colleague, Dr. Marika Tacconi. And she's going to tell you about the whole fascinating process of discovering and um, realizing this music that hasn't been heard in hundreds of years, which is pretty, pretty exciting. And I think you'll just you'll agree that the world of a musicologist is maybe a little bit like a private detective. You do some sleuthing, and she's going to have another revelation that I don't even think anybody in the uh, in the ensemble knows. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my wonderful colleague, Dr. Marika Tacconi, distinguished professor of musicology. Well, that was a beautiful, beautiful piece, a hard act to follow. My goodness, I feel like I should be dancing on stage here. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to my colleague, Jim Lyon. Um, so the revelation that Jim was referring to, it's not a huge revelation, but it's kind of fun. Um, so I was looking at the image of, here, go back to the poster, the image of Salomon Erosi on our flyer, and I thought, boy, this composer is too well-dressed. It doesn't look like he is a composer. It looks like he is, uh, I don't know, you know, a member of the aristocracy. And sure enough, I did some investigation. And um, so this is Salomon Rossi on the left, and that is the Duke of Mantua, who was actually his patron. And you can see that Salomon Rossi is not quite as fancily dressed as, um, as the Duke of Mantua, but there's a certain resemblance, so I can see how it would be really easy to uh, confuse those two, uh, those two, a kind of a broad forehead and a mustache and a beard and all of that, so that's my revelation. Uh, but let's get on to the real topic of the, e of the evening. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the next piece on the program, which is uh, by Antonio Sacchini, and it is a lovely duet that we will hear tonight for only the second time in modern days. So the first time uh, this piece was performed last July in Venice, Italy. Uh, it was part of a collaboration uh, that I had with uh, some musicians in Venice, the Venice Music Project. So we kind of brought this piece back to light after 250 years of obscurity. And you might be wondering, why is that? Why was this piece never heard before? And by the way, how many of you have heard of this composer, Sacchini? Not even my musicology colleague. I myself, I myself did not know about Sacchini until about two years ago. So you are, you are safe. <laughs> I do not blame anyone for not having heard of Sacchini. Sacchini is not known today. But I think after this performance, you will agree that he deserves to be heard. His music is really special. And in fact, uh, he was regarded as one, as one of the greatest composers of the time. So I want to provide some context around this piece of music, tell you a little bit about um, who Sakini was and the music that he wrote and who he wrote it for. 
So we're going to transport ourselves to the beautiful city of Venice, Italy, where I have had the fortune of spending some time lately um, as part of my research there. And specifically, what I want to tell you right off the bat is that this composer, Sacchini, was associated with a, um, an orphanage, with this institution that was called, and is still called today, the Ospedaletto. And what is the Ospedaletto? The Ospedaletto was one of four so-called Ospedali Grandi. These were uh, charitable institutions that were founded in the primarily 15th century, 15th and 16th centuries, to take in the poor, the disabled, and especially the orphaned. And uh, this was kind of in keeping with the policy of the Republic of uh, Venice to provide for the needy, which I thought was a really wonderful policy that we could all learn from today. So the four ospedali you can see, I marked them on this map, are in different parts of the city. Um, and they still stand today. They're not orphanages anymore. One is a five-star hotel, one is uh, uh, an art school, so they all have different functions today, but they still stand. You can still see where these sites were. The one of these ospedali that some of you may have heard of before is the Ospedale della Pietà, and this is the most well-known of the four because this is where Vivaldi um, worked and composed music and provided instruction to a number of these orphaned girls. So of the four, this is the one that you probably have heard of. But all four were really active in their day. And uh, I want to read you a quote here uh, by a French scholar named Charles de Brosse. And this is what he wrote about the Ospedali of Venice in the year 1739. He says, a transcending music here in Venice is that of the Ospedali. There are four of them made up of illegitimate or orphaned girls. They are trained solely to excel in music. And so they sing like angels and play the violin, the flute, the organ, the cello, the bassoon. No instrument frightens them, and each concert is given by about 40 girls. So this points to the fact that these young orphaned women who were trained by some of these incredible musicians and composers of the time gave public concerts. And there are paintings that depict some of these uh, uh, public um, performances that they gave. This is one from the Pietà, but there are other paintings that display uh, these women in other ospedali as well. So let's talk a little bit about the Ospedaletto, because the work by Sacchini that we will hear tonight is associated with this one of the, uh, this one Ospedale, uh, known as the Ospedaletto, or the full name Santa Maria dei Derelitti. And um, this was a ospedale that was, that was founded in 1528, again, to take in orphaned girls. Um, and you can see that it is still there in that part of Venice. Uh, there are many composers I could mention. We don't have time today to go through some of the big names. This list could be really, really long. I've just given you uh, five of the most important composers. You will see that Sacchini is among them, but there are others that provided music, and part of my recent research has been to kind of uncover some of this music, to bring it back. Um, some of these pieces are known, other pieces have been in obscurity for centuries, and they deserve to be heard. So, um, you may be wondering also, how did these ospedali, the Ospedaletto and the other three, afford to hire these superb musicians and composers? Well, uh, many of these orphans were actually uh, foundlings. So they were the illegitimate daughters of aristocrats of Venice. So these aristocrats provided money to uh, take in their young girls and to educate them and to attract these really famous musicians and composers. Um, so, interesting to understand that aspect of it. Okay, let's talk about Sacchini. Born in Florence, moved to Naples at a very young age, 
was educated in Naples, studied violin, voice, and composition, and then his career brought him to Rome, Venice, London, and Paris. Those were all really major musical centers of the time. Wrote over 50 operas. I find this absolutely astonishing when you think by comparison that Mozart wrote 22 operas, uh, Handel wrote 42, if I'm not mistaken. So he wrote more than some of the major opera composers of the time. Many of these operas are lost today. A few survive, but are not uh, very often performed. And as I said earlier, very highly regarded. And uh, I want to give you a sense of uh, how well esteemed he was at the time. He not only wrote music for the orphanage of the Ospedaletto, uh, specifically for the young women who were known as the Figlie di Coro, but he was also a great singing master. And his pupils included lots of names, but I want to mention two of them, Anna Storace, uh, who had roles in operas by Mozart and Salieri, and Adriana Gabrielli, who was also known as Adriana Ferrarese del Bene, uh, and she was the first singer to play Mozart's Fior di Ligi in Così Fan Tutte. Those of you who were at the opera last, what day was that, Thursday, I think, uh, heard the finale to act one of this opera, Così Fan Tutte, and you saw Fior di Ligi on stage. So uh, this Adriana Ferrarese was the original, the first Fior di Ligi, and um, again, she was trained by Antonio Sacchini himself. Um, I want to read this quote. It's a little long, but I think it deserves some attention because you will see that there are references, there's a reference to both Sacchini and to this uh, young singer that I mentioned, uh, Ferrarese. So Charles Burney was a British music historian who traveled extensively to Italy, down, went down to Italy, traveled extensively, and wrote a very famous kind of eyewitness account where he chronicled all of the amazing music that he heard while he was traveling in Italy. He went to France as well, but we'll focus on Italy. And um, so he goes down to Naples and Florence and Rome and all of the musical centers of the time, but was most intrigued by what he heard in Venice. And he went to the Ospedaletto on several occasions, and this is what he says in the year 1770. I went to the Ospedaletto, of which Signor Sacchini is the master, and was indeed very much pleased by the music composition, which was singing when I entered the church. It was new, spirited, and full of ingenious contri contrivances for the instruments, which always said something interesting without disturbing the voice. Upon the whole, there seemed to be as much genius in this composition as in any that I had heard since my, ar my arrival in Italy. The performers here are all orphan girls. One of them, there she is, La Ferrarese, sang very well and had a very extraordinary compass of voice as she was able to reach the highest E of our harpsichords upon which she could dwell a considerable time in a fair, natural voice. So clearly he was impressed not only by the composer Sacchini and his music, by, but also by some of the young women that he heard perform, and specifically La Ferrarese. So as we hear Sacchini's piece tonight, I would like you to imagine this context um, surrounding this music. Okay, let's get to uh, the actual piece. I want to tell you just a little bit about it and how we brought this duet back to light, as it were. Um, as I mentioned, this is a work that I unearthed from the archives, from the libraries, and we will hear it tonight for only the second time in modern times, first time anywhere else, anywhere outside of Venice. Um, and there are two manuscripts of this piece that have come down to us. The first one is ended up in London. We don't know how it ended up there, but it is in London today. Uh, you see here uh, a page from that manuscript, uh, British Library. The other one is this one here, which is in a library in Karlsruhe, Germany. 
And you will notice that in this particular manuscript, you see that there are two texts. Okay, let me go back to the previous slide. That is the Italian, Giacchè mia sposa se, which is the title of the piece. In the other manuscript, it might be a little hard to read from down here, but there are two texts. The original Italian, Giacchè mia sposa se, and then a Latin text that has been added uh, below the original Italian, uh, Veni electa mea. So when I saw this, I was really intrigued, and I wanted to kind of find out why. It is highly unusual to have a piece of music with two different texts in two different languages. Um, here are my very rough translations of the opening of the Italian text, the opening of the Latin text, and you will see that the Latin text on the right-hand side is derived from the Bible. Uh, it is uh, from the Song of Songs, from the Holy Bible, therefore, obviously, a religious sacred text. So when we prepared a modern edition of this piece based on these two manuscripts, we had some choices to make. We had to decide which of these two manuscripts are we going to use as kind of the main source. Um, it was hard to make that decision. So what we decided to do in our edition is to actually combine the two sources and to underlay both of these texts, both the Italian and the Latin. So this is the edition that was prepared um, by the Venice Music Project. The transcription was done by one of their sopranos, Caterina Chiarcos. I provided some guidance as a musicologist. We received support from a grant from the Delmas Foundation, and we're using this edition, the musicians are using this particular transcription and edition for the performance this evening. Uh, and we're very grateful, of course, to Venice Music Project for allowing us to do this free of charge. So um, you'll see that we have therefore used, um, applied, underlaid both of these texts. And I'll tell you just in a second um, how we are going to perform this, because we're not going to perform both texts at the same time. We're going to have to make some choices there. Um, and by the way, thanks to this uh, grant from the Delmas Foundation, uh, these scores, this one and other pieces that we transcribed, are now available through the Venice Music Project website for others to be able to use and to perform from. So, as I said, the first performance of this piece was last July uh, in Venice. Um, we had the two sopranos, Lisa Audenweller and Katerina Kerkos, singing. I was really happy to provide the pre-concert lecture for that event, and you can see me there very excited about this kind of world premiere in modern times. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to start the performance uh, with the Italian text. You will hear our sopranos starting with the beautiful Italian language. And then about a, about a third of the way through, they're going to switch to Latin. Now, this would probably not have been done back in the time, but I want a modern audience to appreciate the dual nature of this piece, and therefore its kind of Italian version and its Latin version. There's another very interesting moment in this piece that I want to point out, and I saw Tim Dighton earlier, and there he is, our viola professor, my viola colleague up there, and I gave him a little uh, sneak preview that I was going to say something really exciting about, about, about the viola tonight. So um, those of you who are familiar with the viola as an instrument know that the viola doesn't always get the best parts in an orchestra setting, for example, right? It's kind of, you know, looking at you violists in the ensemble, you know what I'm talking about. The violins get all the glory, and the violas are there kind of supporting the violins. But you have a grand moment in this piece, violists, right? I'm looking at, where are you? You three, yes. Um, there is this one moment in the piece where the violas shine. They have this really kind of elaborate part that outshines the violins. And this is really interesting and somewhat unusual. And I think that what might be happening here is that one of the orphan girls was probably a violist. And this was a moment for her 
to be on full display, right? For Sakini to write something to just bring attention uh, to this violist. So that, yes, the violins get their moments, and certainly the sopranos get a lot of attention, but the violists get their attention too. And what I love about this is that when you look at the British Library manuscript, it's not in there. It's only in the other manuscript with the dual texts that you find Sakini adding the viola part. So that tells me that this piece probably originated as an opera piece. And then once Sakini arrived at the Ospedaletto as the maestro there and started writing music for the orphans, then he had them in mind. And he had their individual talents in mind and added this viola part to be sure that this potentially gifted violist had her moment of glory. So what is behind the dual nature of this duet? I just kind of um, told you a little bit about the fact that you know one is a secular text likely taken from an opera by Sacchini that is probably lost today. The other is a Latin text that would have been appropriate for a church setting. And when we think about the Ospedaletto, uh, this institution, there were two main music venues. There was the church, which is on the left there, um, that is still there today. You can go and hear concerts there sometimes. And then there is this beautiful Sala de la Musica, or music room, that was built specifically for these young women uh, to perform in, to give their public performances in for a live audience. And so in my view, the church setting would have been a, the, the appropriate setting for the Latin version of this piece, and the Sala de la Musica would have been the appropriate venue for the secular version of this piece. Uh, there is the church once again, and just to point out, I don't know if you can see it, but on the very top above the high altar, there's an organ. And on the side of the organ, there is a, there's a large choir loft or gallery uh, that is divided by a grill, a metal grill. And that's where the orphan girls would have sung and performed from. So why the grill? To keep their modesty uh, away from the praying looks of the male congregation uh, or the male audience below. And same thing in the Sala de la Musica, which is a beautiful space and acoustically perfect. Uh, here too, I'm looking at the bottom image, uh, there is a grill. And you see there, that's actually the, the soprano, Lisa Odenweller, uh, standing, singing behind that grill. And uh, you can kind of see her, but only in kind of um, broad, you know, broad, terms, not well-defined. And I think that was another way to, again, obscure these young um, women. Okay, so again, the two texts and what I just told you, which is that, you know, um, the secular would have been probably originated, originated from an opera, uh, something that would have been sung in the Sala de la Musica of the Ospedaletto versus the sacred Latin version of this uh, duet that would have been sung in a church setting, uh, in a liturgical setting, perhaps. So, with that, I will end my little introduction, and I know we are all very excited to hear this, this piece, and I just want to thank not only James Lyon for agreeing to add this uh, piece to our program, uh, which I think fits into this kind of marginalized voices. These are women that truly found their voice through music through singing. Think about the fate that they could have had had it not been for music, for the instruction that they received, which in some cases allowed them to become professional musicians and to have these leading roles in some of the major operas of the day by Mozart and Haydn and others. Um, so 
thank you for this opportunity, and I want to thank the ensemble, and especially our two soprano soloists, Ali Brault and Erica Harvey, who have learned this piece with not much time, and have done a really superb job at bringing this music to, to life. So thank you very much, and happy listening.